Okay, you quieted down by yourself. The, uh, I'm going to say we're going to start on time. The, uh, and uh, as I think many of you can appreciate, the, uh, a year of what's standing between me and a cold beer. So, so we're going to get this done and get it done on time, okay? I've had, a, I've had a good two days here, but I'm looking forward to some relaxation. But this is uh, a fun panel that we're, uh, discussion that we're going to have here. We're going to talk about some good things. The... Uh, I think normally you would see, I think you heard that uh, Charlie Allen uh, is a bit indisposed, uh, uh, recovering from knee surgery. He would normally be up here, but he's uh, going to expect a very detailed uh, after action review from me. So uh, that will be my next uh, task after this. The, um, but anyway, so uh, you've heard me introduce plenty of times, so you know what I do now. Uh, but uh, I thought it might be interesting. I think most of the folks on the panel know, uh, but uh, it's interesting for me to recount once in a while that uh, how did I get involved in this? Why am, why am I doing this? You know? And this gets back to uh, 45 years ago. Um, I was starting my second uh, assignment in the Army. I just finished a great experience in, overseas in the Panama Canal Zone with the 8th Special Forces Group, and I was all fired up about being in the Army. And I got assigned to the 902nd MI Group at Fort Meade, Maryland, and I was the special agent in charge of the Fort Meade Resident Office, and I was doing background investigations <laughs> in Anne Arundel County, Prince George's County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and that was an adventure sometimes, uh, and the Eastern Shore. So that was my first experience with background investigations. The Army trained me very well. Uh, I, I really know how to do an interview now. Uh, but then, you know, I went away from it. I did other Army things. Then somehow, after my Army career, I ended up on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And guess what we did in 2004? We wrote, we wrote IRTPA. Geez, it had a little bit in there about security clearance reform. Uh, and then somehow somebody suggested it might be a good idea if I go uh, serve at the ODNI, which I did, initially in military support, but then later on I became part of this new thing called uh, policy plans and requirements which somehow ended up with responsibility for the Special Security Clearance uh, Center, which was implementing security clearance reform, uh, working with John Fitzpatrick. Uh, and then, you know, I retired from the ODNI and said, I'm finally done with that, you know? And then I went to ANSA. And when I walk in the door, I find out that Charlie Allen has started a security policy reform council, you know? And we're looking at uh, security clearance stuff. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, this is really going to date me, you know, some of you probably remember the, uh, the little Abner uh, cartoon from, from years and years ago, but it had a little character in there named Joe Biffstick, who was this little guy that walked around with a dark cloud over his head, you know, so that's what I feel like, I just can't get rid of the security clearance thing, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think we're actually uh, at that point of, uh, of actually getting something done. Know, that uh, you know, I think we got some momentum. Uh, it's been, been on all of our minds for a long time. Uh, uh, to say that a lot has happened uh, in this last year, I think would be a bit of an understatement in terms of some decisions that have finally been made uh, to move things in certain directions. Uh, we've had a lot of sessions over the last four years here at this summit and in other venues that, uh, that uh, many of us have been a part of. Uh, ENSA and CSIS, uh, other uh, separate uh, conferences and so forth on security clearance reform. Uh, we think we focused a lot of attention on it, and it's, and, uh, but I think we all know that it's something that needs a lot of attention and it's something that we all uh, very uh, seriously want to uh, uh, constructively uh, affect. Um, this year, though, we wanted to do a little bit different. All the other sessions we've tried to focus on you know, we got a problem, we need to fix it, and an, an awful lot of that went down to reducing backlog and reducing timelines. Uh, and we've talked about some 
uh, advanced ways of doing things, but we really get consumed by the uh, by the by the mission at hand and the, and the press of, of daily business and getting people cleared and so forth. What we wanted to do today was uh, was kind of see if we can look over the horizon a little bit. We're going to end up talking a little bit about you know things that we're tweaking now, uh, but we have. Uh, uh, I think you'll hear from some of the folks here that you know some good progress is being made now uh, in terms of reducing the backlog and bringing the timelines back down and so forth. But I guess the question I would ask all of you to think about and the panelists to try and address is that good enough? Uh, and what more uh, do we need to do to be pushing this uh, to uh, to another to another level? What is uh, what does uh, uh, the end state uh, ideally look like here? Uh, what is the art of the possible? How do we re really shift from a risk-averse uh, uh, process uh, to a risk management uh, approach to uh, this issue? Um, there's lots of drivers uh, that motivate us. You know, the old system, uh, I guess we could say it served us well for 50 years, but you know, some of the recent things that we're all aware of, the, the Snowdens, the Martins, the Alexis, the, uh, the uh, reality winners, all those sorts of things. Uh, were those things that we could have done better on? Or, or is the system working uh, the way uh, in this uh, day and age, in this information age, the way we want it to? Is there, can we do this better? It's costly, the way we're doing it. Uh, the loss of productivity uh, associated with it especially with lag times, reciprocity issues, those sorts of things. You know, and finally, you know, in one breath we'll hear agency directors, as we've heard uh, yesterday and so forth, you know, they talk about their workforce and all that sort of stuff. Uh, in term, and, they, and I think uh, General Nakasone told us uh, a few weeks ago that they get 17,000 applications a month at NSA. Wow. Uh, I don't think we've got the metrics on it exactly of, you know, of all the conditional offers that are made, offers that are made, how many are actually executed? Are we, are we getting the best talent? Are we losing talent because we're not moving fast enough sort of stuff uh, when we're competing for resources with an increasingly aggressive commercial sector? So all of those sorts of questions uh, that uh, we can uh, bring to our panelists today about how, how we can do this better. So we've got a great panel here. I'm going to introduce them a little bit. Okay. Matt Eanes, Director of Security, Suitability, and Credentialing at the PAC PMO. Uh, a dedicated change agent. He's been working at this stuff for 15 years. Um, and I think he would be proud to say a Hokie. <laughs> good week. <laughs> yeah, they had a good, they had a good uh, week on uh, a good day on Monday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, Brian Dunbar. Uh, Brian is the Assistant Director, Special Security Directorate at uh, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, responsible for developing and implementing the security executive agent's responsibilities to develop and implement policies and procedures for conducting investigations and adjudicating investigations. Uh, career CIA officer and a proud Hampton, Sydney graduate. Also a hokey. <laughs> Santa hokey. Uh, Carrie Wibben, I think all of you know Carrie, uh, Director of Counterintelligence and Security at USDI, responsible for developing the DOD policies and procedures for assuming government wide responsibility for this uh, investigative responsibility. Prior to that, she worked with uh, Matt at PAC PMO. Uh, and led the presidential review of the Navy Yards uh, shooting, and also worked before that with uh, with uh, with John and others out at the Special Security Center. So around this problem for a long, long time. Uh, interesting to note with Kerry, uh, graduated from West Point and uh, several uh, combat tours as a military policeman. So thanks for your service, Trish Stokes. Uh, director of the new Defense Vetting Service uh, at DSS, overseeing the transfer of the background investigative mission uh, from NBIB to DOD and DSS. Moreover, she has been intimately involved in this process for a long time, 
uh, leading a lot of the initial uh, continuous evaluation pilots that the Army did uh, that's gotten us to where we are today in the process. Uh, three decades, uh, over three decades in uh, DOD, working for the Army, the Navy, SOCOM, DSS, and uh, the Missile Defense Agency. And finally, Jeff Jonas. Jeff is my disruptive technology for today, okay? Are you gonna let me down, Jeff? <laughs> um, so Jeff, uh, he's been around this problem for a long time too. You know, John reminded me he was on one of the initial uh, uh, pilot projects on, on this stuff uh, many years ago. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Senzing, and he can talk a little bit more about that. He's a data scientist. He's an entrepreneur. I think you've sold, what, three or four companies? Okay. <laughs> um, he's a futurist. You know, he's a visionary. Uh, he's got some interesting history in detecting and reacting to risky behavior. That he maybe can uh, share with us. Uh, but he's, uh, but check out his bio. He's a, he was a really fascinating person. And it's Dr. Jonas, uh, because he has an honorary PhD from Claremont Graduate University. So with that, those are our panelists. I'm going to ask each of them kind of as an opening gamut. Each one of them has kind of a homework assignment, okay? So Matt's going to lead off talking about overall government reform uh, that OMB has initiated, but uh, then some specific focus on security clearance and why, why now, and so forth, and probably preemptively where are we at on the EO, and you know, is that going to, even if we don't get it anytime soon, or is that going to slow things down? Uh, then we're going to go to Brian, and Brian's going to talk to us about key elements of Trusted Workforce 2.0 and where we're going. Uh, and I'm going to ask him to think about what should Workforce 10.0 look like, okay? <laughs> and Carrie, uh, Carrie's going to tell us about the challenges and opportunities of taking on this mission at, uh, at the DOD level all of the policy-related stuff that they're going to have to put in place uh, to, to make this work, not just for DOD, but for the entire government. Uh, as I mentioned, Trish has uh, got a lot of experience in this CE stuff, but she's going to talk to us about the progress uh, and the challenges of actual implementation from a DSS standpoint. And then finally, Jeff, tell us what we're missing. Okay? So, Matt, over to you. Doing my homework real quick. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today with an opportunity uh, to speak with you on personnel vetting reform. Uh, the Performance Accountability Council, for those of you who might not know, was stood up by executive order and is accountable to the president for reform in this space. Uh, it's made up of 13 member agencies and it's chaired by the OMB Deputy Director for Management. Uh, and aside from the DDM, its leadership consists of the uh, ODNI as the security executive agent setting policy for uh, security clearances, uh, OPM director as the suitability and credentialing executive agent uh, setting policy for employment and receiving uh, government issued credentials or badges, and the USDI for DOD as the largest consumer of background investigations, and as you just heard, the uh, soon to be the largest provider of background investigations. Uh, as the director of the PAC PMO, uh, my organization is responsible for <laughs> assisting agencies with planning and execution of reform efforts. Uh, but more simply, we wake up every day focused 100% of our time on the, reforming this space. Uh, a space that we feel is, um, is incredibly critical. Um, we've heard very loud and clear from agencies and industry, the Hill, um, everyone's been very vocal about the mission impacts that the BI process has had uh, recently, but uh, also over the last couple of, of decades. Um, the PAC couldn't, uh, and the PAC leadership couldn't agree more that the time is, is ripe for reforming this space. Uh, you'll see this highlighted by the administration throughout the president's management agenda as an enabling function on the workforce of the 21st century gear. Uh, as a cap goal on performance.gov, and it is an item included on the delivering government solutions in the 21st century reform plan and re 
three organization recommendations. Uh, PAC leadership has made it clear to us and uh, at our level and across the government that now is the time for reform uh, and now is the time for bold reform. Uh, we've set forth a series of reform uh, efforts uh, that are well underway, uh, which you're going to hear about some of them today. Uh, you can also check out uh, performance.gov for updates as we make progress. Uh, just a couple big things to note. Uh, the first one is Trusted Workforce 2.0 that Brian's going to tell you a little bit more about. Uh, this is an effort led by the executive agents that was recently kicked off in April. Uh, and it's taking a, a, a focus on, first of all, reducing the background investigation inventory, and we've got some good gains there. Uh, and uh, looking at redefining a bold new approach for the uh, vetting process. Uh, second, the NBIB to DOD transfer. Uh, Tricia and Carrie will talk to you about this uh, a bit more, but this is well underway. Uh, question on the executive order, it's still working itself through the process. Uh, but it hasn't slowed down all the good and great work that the teams are doing between NBIB and DOD. Uh, we've been given, uh, my perspective, a unique opportunity uh, at this, uh, as Jeff would say, time-space window. Uh, you know, we've got everything lined up from the policy, the process, the technology, uh, the political importance, the external drivers. Uh, all of these things are aligning in this unique small space-time continuum for us to finally uh, fix this problem. Um, in concert with our interagency teams, with input from the Hill, uh, from industry, uh, we're really excited to put in place uh, a long-term solution that will hopefully hold for another 50 years, um, but ideally be a bit more malleable <laughs> so that it can adapt to threats in, in the changing uh, environment. Uh, I think over the next year, when we come back next year, hopefully we'll be invited back for another panel. Uh, we'll be able to talk about uh, some real and meaningful progress that we've made along the way uh, toward a capability that's more intuitive, more effective, more efficient, and more responsive to your needs. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Brian Dunbar, as Chuck mentioned, I'm at ODNI, now in the Special Security Directorate there. And we are charged with implementation of the DNI's responsibilities as the security executive agent. As Chuck and Matt both mentioned, the DNI has responsibilities for policy and oversight regarding things such as investigations, adjudications, if applicable, polygraph. And the director at YIM is the, is the main staff arm, again, for the implementation of those responsibilities. So Chuck told us earlier that we were going to have three minutes for our opening remarks. That may have morphed into five minutes, I understand. Three to five. Yeah. But I'm going to try to get it in, in three minutes. I want to tell you very quickly about something called, Matt mentioned called Trusted Workforce 2.0. Uh, we're really excited about this initiative. It's something that kicked off back in April amongst the interagency, all of the organizations at this table. Uh, from the government are represented in that across the interagency. It's being led by DNI as the SECIA and OPM as the suitability and credentialing executive agent for the government with full partnership again with the organizations you see represented here as well as industry and uh, many other organizations frankly that aren't sitting here today. It uh, was set up to be, I'll use the word, blue sky, clean slate look at how we do vetting across the government enterprise. And it touches on a number of different things, but frankly, we're looking to do things better, more efficiently, faster, uh, use of automation. There are any a number, number of good initiatives going on under the rubric of Trusted Workforce 2.0. So we started, as I mentioned, in April, had a large group come together up at the uh, DNI campus in Bethesda, talked about a number of things, had very rich discussion. Uh, there was a consensus around the room during those discussions that the first thing that the 2.0 needed to tackle was the background investigation inventory, AKA the backlog, uh, which <coughs> exists in the government. So we took that on as the first thing, and again, with 
with uh, the interagency construct involving the PAC principal organizations. We sat down together on a tiger team, if you will. We ended up coming up with approximately 16 uh, mitigation measures that we believed were appropriate to apply to, uh, again, reduce this inventory of background investigations, particularly at the National Background Investigations Bureau. And in June, uh, there was a joint issuance and executive correspondence that came out from the DNI and Director OPM, which contain these mitigation measures. They've been put into place, and I'm happy to report that thus far we're seeing some really great progress along those lines somewhere around um, 70 to 80,000, and it varies from day to day, um, continues to decrease from day to day, but uh, reduction in the background investigation inventory since June when we put that into place. So having put that um, phase one effort of Trusted Workforce 2.0 into place, we've pivoted now on to phase two. Phase two is, uh, if you will, the modernization of the system. Okay, that's looking across the board at the way the government does vetting, um, you know, the things that you might expect like guidelines, standards, but also looking into the future about how we want to utilize automation. Uh, you'll hear a lot about continuous evaluation, I think, today as, as the panel goes on, but there are any number of fruitful ideas um, and concepts across that workspace that we believe we can put into place. We're under an aggressive time frame to uh, have a lot of the framework for this in place by the end of this calendar year. That's the promise that we made, and we're sticking to that. And uh, we're having a, a lot of great partnership um, on all of these things. And, and Matt, um, in his typically humble way, didn't mention, but the PAC PMO is acting, if you will, as executive sec secretariat for this effort. So there's tons of great work going on uh, amongst Matt and his team augmented by folks from different departments and agencies who are helping on the effort there. But we're very excited about the 2.0, and we're looking forward to, um, as Matt mentioned, the delivery of a framework which is uh, going to move us in the right direction. Okay, so before Carrie speaks, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a terrible moderator <laughs> from the standpoint of I'm, I was supposed to give you some instructions beforehand, the, uh, but the... Uh, just a, a quick uh, one, you saw index cards uh, on your chairs. I think you know what those are for. Uh, but uh, if you have a question that you want to get asked here, and I'm counting on you, because I got a few, but I'm counting on you to ask the really hard questions. Uh, but uh, if you got an index card, just hold it up and somebody will come collect it and get it up to me, okay? Uh, secondly, we're on the record, so just wanted to remind everybody of that. and. Uh, Third, if uh, you came in here wanting to get continuous education credit, there'll be somebody in the back to scan your badge when you're done, and you will get credit for the session, okay? So with that, Carrie, back okay. to you, your turn. Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Chuck, and thank you for uh, asking me to be part of the panel. Um, I, it's hard to know where to start the story on the DOD side, and, and I think where I'll, where I'll start, Commander's Intent is a big deal in DOD. Uh, so I'll start, I think, in May 2017 when we first heard from Secretary Mattis that uh, um, he actually had feelings about this mission uh, in terms of background investigations and uh, felt pretty strongly that um, if we were going to improve the, the state of the, the readiness issue uh, that really the backlog that was mentioned earlier was having on DOD disproportionately um, from everyone else in the federal government as we represent about 80% of the workload at OPM, um, we, <clears throat> we probably were going to have to transition the mission back to DOD and uh, and try to fix it ourselves and kind of get a, a fresh start. Um, but he was very clear about not wanting to transfer the current process, the current way of doing it. Um, he said, I want to I wanna start fresh. I want to um, really uh, do the mission and execute this, this process much differently than it's done today. Um, and, uh, and, and at the same time, the NDAA 2018 language is being drafted, and so fast forward to the end of 2018, and, and we got the mandate to take responsibility for the DOD portion of the mission, again, the 80 percent. Um, back within DOD, uh, we were already very much focused on uh, rebuilding the end-to-end -end IT system, which was a recommendation that came out of the... Um, 
not the Navy Yard, the OPM cyber breach um, review uh, that the, that was a White House led effort, um, and so that decision was the decision was made at that point to give DoD uh, was it about a year prior to that DoD the mission to rebuild the IT. So we were already working on that, and we were rebuilding it as an enterprise IT shared service platform for the whole federal government. So we were really kind of already leaning in pretty heavily to um, frankly leverage a lot of the capital investment DoD had made in terms of uh, various. IT solutions uh, for the adjudications, for the repository, and for something we call continuous evaluation in the middle. So, um, so we really were moving out, uh, developing a three-phase plan to do that. Uh, at the same time, um, the White House had continued the decision-making process, uh, and Matt can speak to this better than I can, to um, to consider, you know, if we're moving eighty percent of it, you know, do we want to just just keep it all together and move it all? all to DOD, um, and that was recently announced, was it April? April time frame, uh, that was announced, that was the intent, and this exec executive order that was mentioned earlier will codify that. So um, so that's really our scope now. Uh, it was hard enough thinking about the DOD part, I'll say, from a challenges standpoint, but I do think, you know, the opportunity we have, uh, thinking about you know, taking on the whole of government mission um, and, you know, leaping us into the future uh, as, a, as a federal government in this space is, is also pretty exciting. So. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot going on. Trish is going to talk uh, in detail about some of the transition efforts that are underway to transition the workforce, all the logistics involved uh, with that piece, and, and really leaning forward in a partnership with OPM and MBIB on that front. Um, I wanted to just touch on uh, where we are again, this continuous evaluation piece being really critical to uh, the new way of doing business. So we have been uh, at about 1.1 million enrolled into DOD's CE solution, which is part of this new end-to-end -end IT system uh, that we're developing. Um, it's called Mirador. And we've been scaling it iteratively over the last several years, and we're going to keep going. We took a bit of a strategic pause at 1.1 million, really because at the same time, under our insider threat programs, we we were developing risk rating algorithms and um, we kind of knew that we really had to somehow bring all of this together. And the NDAA language of 2018 even said integrate, you know, background investigations and insider threat because at the end of the day, really those two missions that were sort of developed uh, independently are trying to solve the same problem. How do you take an outsider, make them a trusted insider, and make sure you can continue to trust them? So it really made no sense to continue down these parallel but still separate and distinguishable, distinguishable paths in terms of insider threat implementation and uh, revamping the background investigation process. So um, we saw that the best opportunity to have kind of a, a early win was with the risk rating algorithms that we had developed. We had been refining, refining them and maturing them. Uh, we got them each, each of the three algorithms to a point where they were over 90, just over 90 percent in terms of their ability to predict risk um, or to predict an individual who would be suspended or revoked. So we, you know, we really were excited to uh, to have an opportunity in June of this past year, and it was several months uh, of work leading up to that, really thanks to Matt and the team and in partnership with the executive agents to um, really through the lens of the backlog, do something pretty uh, big and, and uh, drive a sea change. Uh, through this executive correspondence, this guidance that came out from, from the executive agents. The one that really uh, w was exciting to us was the opportunity to actually do continuous evaluation, continuous vetting when you factor in insider threat capabilities, we call it continuous vetting, um, in, in place of a traditional periodic reevaluation, right? So we could actually start to help the backlog, help out the backlog situation by not keeping, you know, continuing to add to the pile, but in our minds anyway, much more uh, effectively uh, manage risk in our population in a real-time fashion. But CE, you know, if, if we kind of do it the way we have been doing it, it's still kind of cookie cutter. It's still kind of one size fits all. It's more continuous and more frequent, and it mitigates risk more frequently, and Trisha will give you the stats on that, but um, it's still kind of, you know, cookie cutter, and, and we kind of were doing the same CE checks on everybody, regardless of the risk um, that you presented. And so with the algorithms, we realized that we really had an opportunity to kind of be, get a little more sophisticated in how we are approaching continuous evaluation, continuous vetting. So what we're doing now with the 1.1 million, we're, we're, we're scaling up very quickly. We might be closer to 1.2 now, um, but we're going to keep going. But we're not just doing it in a cookie cutter approach where everybody's getting the same CE checks at the same 
same frequency. We are leveraging the risk grading algorithms, running the three, cross-validating them against the 1.1 million, and then categorizing as a stepping stone to true tailored vetting, continuous vetting, high, medium, and low. And then we have a tailored protocol for how we are continuously vetting high risk compared to medium risk compared to, risk compared to low risk. So the high risk will get more checks more frequently low risk, fewer checks, less frequently. Um, and again, that's a stepping stone to, to true tailored, which is which is where we're trying to go, so that we're actually uh, tailoring the vetting that we're doing continuously to the unique risk that an individual, a human in our workforce presents based on the vast amount of human data that we are running the algorithms on. And so we're adding to that person data, environment data set daily. Um, so it's exciting just because, you know, really this, what the executive agents put out to really help with the backlog situation leapt us ahead in our innovation agenda, right, and our ability to actually really move out quickly with continuous evaluation but getting to a more tailorable approach and solution um, to that. So um, I've hit on a number of the things. I'm probably, what am I at, Chuck? Am I at uh, five yeah, minutes? Way over. But. I'm way over. Am I really? I thought I'd be like one minute. Um, 18 and a half. Okay. And then, uh, so let me just mention like two more things. Sorry, I've talked about all that. Um, so everything we do up front in the process, right, affects the decision makers at the back end. Uh, so we, we always are thinking about, well, anything we tweak in the process up front, right, it's a system. So you got the humans at the back end trying to make decisions and we monkey things too, up too much here and it really makes their jobs impossible. So we're focused on there as well from an AI machine learning standpoint, really de developing a virtual adjudicator assistant, uh, first phase, introducing natural language processing, sniffing out bias in our algorithms, and then uh, helping computers help our adjudicators, the human decision makers at the end of the process really do their jobs much, much better in this really data-rich, uh, data-intense, continuous environment that, that we are um, pursuing. Um, I'll talk more about all that. I guess I can't go into that. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is uh, wearing my counterintelligence hat, uh, which has been a bit of a new world for me in this job, um, but three years in, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the integration of counterintelligence and security from my days at NCIX slash now NCSC, National Counterintelligence Security Center, to, to my job now. Um, as it relates to the human risk problem we're trying to solve, there is a lot that, from a counterintelligence standpoint, a lot of improvement, opportunity, uh, I guess would be the positive way to talk about it, uh, that we can make in terms of incorporating um, vetting that we're doing that really a, much more appropriately mitigates against the foreign intelligence or terrorism type threat. Um, and we have a solution really as a result of our, some of our MAVNI challenges. If you're familiar with MAVNI, I won't go into that. Um, but it, it really has forced us to come up with what we feel is a pretty exciting solution and a standardized cap methodology to vet, to screen and vet all foreigners, DOD has 24 populations of foreigners that we screen and vet for some level of access. And um, we, we realize that as we're kind of consolidating that, streamlining that, and centralizing that, it really makes sense to put that, that capability for foreign screening and vetting that will be centralized under the same people doing the U.S. person screening and vetting. And then whenever an individual U.S. person or foreigner comes through our process and presents a foreign intelligence risk, foreign preference, foreign influence, they will automatically get that same vet vetting that we do for the foreigners. So it really gives us an opportunity to appropriately mitigate on, uh, and cover down on that type of threat um, in a way that we historically just have not done a very good job of that. So I'll stop. Okay, here. thanks. Okay, Trish, how are we doing on implementing? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's my turn. <laughs> um, so thank you for Chuck for asking me to to be here. So um, uh, we're very excited about 2.0, uh, Trusted Workforce 2.0 as well, because um, you know we we appreciate uh, all the help. This is a big lift. Uh, we know that, and in, in taking this mission over from from NBIB, um, but I, I think DoD uh, of all places is up for the challenge, just because of all the great work that has been going on in this community a lot because of the people, some of the people at this table, um, <coughs> over the past ten years, and so we're capitalizing on all that work and and building upon it and and building that into the transformation model that that Trust Workforce 2.0 is giving us the executive uh, agents, the SUDA and the SECIA are giving us the authorities now that we've really needed for, for a long time uh, to move uh, some of this forward. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, um, the executive correspondence and Brian mentioned, um, it's really given us an opportunity to jumpstart what we're calling our transformation initiatives. We actually started 
really implementing that and seeing a big difference uh, and deferring and, and moving clean cases directly out, not into legacy, but into, into, our, um, into our new continuous evaluation capability directly, uh, which absolutely helps uh, alleviate or at least doesn't add to uh, the inventory that, that we're trying to work down. So, um, so a lot of good coming, coming out of those, those authorities and we look forward to, to more. Brian, no pressure. Um, but uh, what, what we're doing in, in the department now is, is we are working with MBIB, our partners, uh, on a joint transformation and trans, uh, transfer and transformation plan. Um, the SECDEF has made it clear this is not just a transfer, this is transformation. Do not forget that, so we will not. Um, that is, that is uh, <coughs> clearly our focus. Um, and uh, the, the trans transition plan that we have built together with MBIB really addresses the, the logical things that you would think in a merger and acquisition, and industry knows this probably better than others and probably do it a lot better than the government does. Um, but, um, you know, we, we've got HR um, issues, we've got facility issues that we have to merge, we have financial management systems, we have our acquisitions uh, that have to come together. So um, it, that is a, a very big lift, and we have to do all of that while we are actually transforming the process. So um, we are very much looking forward to the executive order that will be out um, shortly and uh, transferring the mission to us. Um, but we're not standing by idly. We're leading forward uh, in all those areas that, that I uh, just mentioned. Um, I just left a meeting before I came here with our two operational teams, our front end submissions and our, account, uh, and our CE uh, program in DOD that there was a, a room full of people, not quite as big as this one, but there was a lot of people in there working together to figure out what we can do right now to integrate our efforts moving towards transformation, decommissioning older processes, manual processes, and, and moving towards, uh, towards a, a more transformed um, uh, future. Um, so we are, uh, our, our CMO, our Chief Management Office uh, Officer and Office in the Department of Defense um, has been tagged to help us build um, process mapping, business process mapping sessions. We're, we're actually, they're leading those for us with SMEs across the community, um, for both from MBIB and, and from DOD, um, uh, and we are building our new business processes based on some of the great work that the PAC PMO has done, what we call our placemat, which is really kind of the first phase, I'll call it, of transformation, because it's certainly not the final pit phase, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I don't, I don't think, uh, my message to our workforce is we will not have a final phase. The, this will continuously be improved, and when we stop continuously improving this process, then, you know, I, my time's done. Uh, that, that's, that's not what we need to do. We don't need to find ourselves in, in where we are today, where we have a process that we've kind of, you know, 50 years old-ish uh, with some modifications. We need to always look at continuous uh, improvement. We need to look at the data sources that we're using um, to, to identify risk and, and to identify trust. Uh, not just risk, but trust. And we need to take those two factors into consideration in the future. Um, so, so we're, we're working with our MBIB partners right now uh, to identify what data sources you can imagine in the two organizations. There's a lot of data sources, a lot of data use agreements, a lot of systems of record notices, um, and, and a lot of um, shared equities that we need to merge into to one. Um, and so it, it is no small task, um, but we are getting after it every day by, by bringing our workforces together. Um, a couple, oh, they, I, can, I can tell you, we, we, I mean, every aspect of MBIB, to include something you probably wouldn't think about, but the National Training Center, the way we actually train our investigators. Um, and we, we in DSS have the Center for um, Development for Security Excellence. Those two entities have a lot of commonality, so we, we are merging those two entities into one entity and, and building a new training uh, capability for the personnel vetting enterprise. Um, so we, we are also using the MBIB uh, staff that um, they have, they've set up a great liaison uh, program with the community. Um, this is new to us now, we're getting the non-DOD agencies. We are not just gonna be servicing DOD, we're gonna be servicing the non-DOD agencies. The non-DOD agencies are very, I don't wanna call it concerned, but they are wondering if we will be a DOD-centric 
entity. And I think it's a very fair concern, and we're trying to make sure we alleviate that concern from them because they are a customer just like DOD is a customer. So we're, we're working with the, um, the NBIB liaison teams and going out and doing joint um, meetings with those agencies, such as Department of um, State and, and Justice and et cetera, um, uh, because we, we can't forget this is we're taking on the national enterprise. Um, uh, the, I will be also um, joining Mr. Phelan on some road trips in the next um, in the next couple of months, uh, where he will be taking me to a lot of his operational entities and and uh, and and letting me really look under the hood with a few of my uh, teammates and and uh, to to look at um, and moving things forward. But I don't want you to think that, and I and I do stress what our sec secretary has told us: we will not be um, taking on legacy processes, we will be transforming. And so we're, as I'm going out and learning everything I didn't know about MBIB, I'm looking at it Talk through the lens of, of, of transformation. She needs a hook? Yeah. I need the hook? <laughs> <laughs> did, did I beat you? I don't know. <laughs> that would be impossible. Um, the last thing I'll mention is um, is that when we did stand up the what we're calling the Defense Vetting Center, uh, at least current name, um, or Defense Vetting Directorate within DSS is that we, we merged together um, everything vetting. So uh, I see Mr. Michael Siege, who is the, um, the director of our DITMAC, our Insider Threat Management and Analytics Center for the Department of Defense. All of our Personnel Security Management Office for Industry that you guys probably know about, uh, run by Ms. Ms. Heather Green, our CE Program Management Office, and not to forget the DOD CAF. The DOD CAF will be integrated into uh, our, our agency in effective 1 October. Um, and, and so all those things nested together are the start of our personnel vetting enterprise, and having them together will hopefully breed uh, efficiencies and, and effectiveness. That's... Okay, Jeff, so... I'm, the, uh, I'm lots thinking, of, lots boy, where to begin? Yeah. Where to begin? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so the... I thought so. I'd begin in the 90s. I was in Vegas. I was helping the casinos build insider threat and continuous vetting systems, and one of those systems uh, was called NORA, Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness, at Coffee Eye of Incutel, uh, they gave me some funding in 2001. Around that time, I'd never even heard of the term IC, just to set the stage. In 2003, I find myself talking to a CIA counterintelligence, excuse me, a counterterrorism analyst. And it was a very defining moment. I, I look at her and I say, well, what do you wish you could have if you could have anything? And she looks at me and she thinks about it for a minute. And she goes, I wish I could get answers to my questions faster. It's a very reasonable thing you would expect, you know, anybody should want, but it, it struck me as utterly insane. It was a two-move checkmate. Question one I had for her was, but what if it's not a smart question today <clears throat> when you ask the question? What is, if more data arrives over the coming weeks and months, what if you ask that question in a few months? Oh, it's a great question then. And she looks at me slightly defeated and goes, that could happen. And then I just thought about it and I said, but what are the chances you can ask every smart question every day? And I kid you not, she looks at me totally defeated and just says, we can't. Now in hindsight, I should have been thinking, I mean, she was a counterterrorism intelligence analyst, so I should have been thinking, we're all gonna die. <laughs> 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 but, you know, on a more um, practical level, it, it, it brought out this, this phrase that I've been uh, uh, sharing with everybody called, do you want systems where the data finds the data and the things that are relevant find you? It's really a con continuous vetting statement. It turns out every piece of data that hits the enterprise is the question. What's happening today is data arrives and lands and ends in all these piles and then periodically you try to run analytics. But if, if you really consider that every new piece of data is the question, now let me give you an example. You discover some criminal activity, and you realize Billy the Kid is gonna to go to jail, but you're quite sure Billy's been working with somebody inside the organization, but you don't know who. Six months later, one of your employees changes their emergency contact phone number, and it's the same phone number that's in the investigation. There's almost no organizations on Earth today that can do that, that can see that, unless they're playing this game where data finds data. It means when something changes on an employment record, if it's related to something else in the enterprise, that would matter then you'd want to figure that out and then tell somebody. So I bring this up only because it captures now, you know, as I, as I know what the, the community is doing around its goals around continuous evaluation, it just reminds me of this notion that you want to evaluate the data as it's arriving. So 
Since then, I've had a hand in a few uh, continuous evaluation insider threat programs across the community, and I want to tell you one practical story from one of them. And they're not doing different frequencies for different kinds of people. Everything's 100% continuous split second, just sort of to set that. But what's most interesting about this particular program is on any given day when they find they need to take action to not let somebody in the door, over 70% of the things that they find every day were people that had, they had just previously let in the door. So as we work on speeding up, so my, my thought process around what we're doing is as we speed up getting people into the system, we need to increase that due diligence continuously. And I think it's really gonna be possible and we should strive for, whether it's 2.0 or 10.0, we should strive for continuous means continuous, not different frequencies based on different people. Because I think that that is something that is attainable. Okay. 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 <laughs> I, under two minutes, how's that? Okay, no, that was great. Am I your best friend now? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, as I listened to all this, uh, we heard uh, lots of terms, and we've had some conversations before uh, about uh, do we all understand lexicon the same way? Uh, we've talked about continuous evaluation. We've talked about uh, continuous monitoring. We've talked about insider threat programs. We've talked about continuous vetting and so forth. Uh, one, are we all saying the same thing when we're using those terms? I'm not sure we are yet. Uh, and that's something we're going to try and help contribute to in terms of the discussion, but any thoughts you guys have on that. But secondly, one way or another, we're going to implement this continuous vetting sort of a process. We'll come back to social media in a second uh, in that regard, but just specifically now on, 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 on that question, we're going to implement uh, in, in some measure this continuous vetting process. When we do that, what, how do you define acceptable risk? What is acceptable risk when we put that sort of a process in place? Well, from my, from my standpoint, Chuck, um, ri risk takes on, and Carrie referenced earlier, you, you heard about the low, the medium, and the high risk. Um, of course, in, in the intelligence world particularly, um, we are looking at, uh, the reason we're doing security clearances at all is because we're vetting the, uh, our, our opinion at least based on data, that the individual will adequate and adequately and properly protect classified information. So um, acceptable risk, and, and, and here I, I'd, I'd mention, um, the fact that every day risk determinations are going on in terms of adjudications across the government. I mean, we have very few perfect people, frankly, out there. So, you know, we're looking at um, individuals' behavior and then we're weighing, again, against a, um, an assessment of whether they can properly protect classified information. Uh, generally, when we take on risk, which again, I'll mention is done daily, I mean, the government is not in a zero risk um, game in terms of security clearances, otherwise we'd have probably almost nobody <laughs> cleared. So um, what we're looking at in terms of that is um, what is the chance that this individual is going to harm national security by divulging classified information. And I think the continuum is based upon the level of access that the person has. Okay, you go from you know, a very low level where the individual is not exposed to a whole lot, and, and frankly, that's something we got to get better on too in terms of um, determining who exactly is going to get cleared and who shouldn't be. Um, a lot of people who are cleared to top secret level see virtually no top secret in the, in the course of their day-to-day -day activities, but we always, you know, go to the larger, the higher level there. But um, you have to ask yourself, I mean, eventually at the highest level, what is existential risk and what that means? And existential risk, of course, I would suggest cases like the ones you cited earlier mm -hmm. in terms of, again, the loss of classified information capabilities, Snowden, um, you know, comes to mind, first of all, those are the ones that you, um, 
you're protecting against at the highest level using all your tools. So Jeff, if the if the purpose of this continuing vet continuous vetting is to detect people, you know, that are starting to go down the road of bad behavior and that we can intervene, I mean, it seems like industry has a better uh, way of accepting risk if they know they can detect something. What are we missing on the government side? Are we, uh, how, how can we do this better uh, on the government side? I think one of the things that we could do is if, it turns out if you have more data, you have more context. And if you have more context, you can make higher quality decisions. And so I like what I've been hearing about maybe combining certain kinds of programs like you know, a vetting program with an insider um, threat program with foreign you know, intel. Uh, when you combine stuff like that, it just gives you more visibility and it's easier to find risk. Okay. Sure. What so we did, I'll, like, just to give you a specific example, in, in, the, in Las Vegas, what we did is we took all of the data from people making hotel reservations, plus people who checked in without reservations, plus all the vendors, plus everybody in the slot club, plus everybody getting casino credit, plus everybody applying for a job, plus everybody employed, plus everybody that was formerly employed that know, knew the policies and procedures, plus 18 different kinds of watch lists, plus people that said they had gambling problems and they have a right to not be marketed to. And we put all that data, we commingled it into one index. And what you get from that is so much greater context and it allows you to make higher quality predictions or decisions about where to, where to focus your attention. Because ultimately, you're going to probably have a human in the loop on this. And the question is, is you're, we're, we're seeking systems that help focus human attention. That's the goal. And that comes from more context. Okay, so we're talking around the edges of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, on, on this stuff. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people immediately say back, well, yeah, that, that can help, but there's so many false positives, right, that, uh, that come up from something like that. How do we, uh, how do we constructively apply this uh, so, that, so that, we, uh, that we can deal with all of that data? Well, I think any, there's different kinds of methods being used in AI and ML, machine learning. By the way, when I use those terms, I would use AI to mean systems that act human smart, and machine learning systems that use experience to get more accurate or, or better. Sometimes AI uses ML, sometimes it doesn't. I'm just clearing up those words, sometimes they get uh, conflated. But one of the challenges is if you have algorithms that are unexplainable, like why does it think that is, looks like a kitty cat? That's not a great thing to put into a human resources process. In fact, you, you could say it violates the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, where you would, could put something derogatory on somebody that denies them employment but not be able to tell them why because you can't explain it. So I wouldn't be using processes that are unexplainable. Okay, Carrie? Yeah, I, so going back to your, you know, CE versus CB, continuous vetting, um, there's a definition in EO 13764. <laughs> Uh, that defines continuous vetting. Um, but really what, what, you know, the executive correspondence and what DOD from an implementation standpoint means when we say continuous vetting, it's this integration piece, um, you know, that Jeff mentioned and that I mentioned earlier, the, the ability to integrate not just doing what we do for clearances more frequently and on a continuous basis, but actually integrating things like these risk rating algorithms, things like user activity monitoring, other data and capabilities that are really, again, still organic uh, and, and done under the insider threat programs that we have across the Department of Defense. We have 43 of them, <coughs> plus a, a enterprise one that Mike Siege runs, uh, 43 insider threat programs. Uh, and so and we have something called IMESA, which is basically at the point of entry for all DOD facilities and installations. We're doing continuous vetting, running a TSDB and NCIC check, and we have a sex offender, and, and making sure that people coming on our bases are not bad, really bad people. Um, but we, you know, so th that's what we mean when we integrate all of those data sets, again, all the human data we're collecting on our workforce or on people who go from outsiders to becoming insiders, even if it's just a day visitor on, a, on Fort Myers. Uh, you really that's what we mean by continuous vetting it's it's expanding the aperture from CE pure kind of what we do in a background investigation today what data sources we look at to really uh, expanding and incorporating and integrating uh, the other data sets that uh, the human data that we collect to inform risk in our population and the other thing I wanted to mention is 
you know, maybe perfect world, I'd collect all the human data that I have available and run analytics and algorithms on it all day to inform, you know, more, the more data the better. Um, when you're trying to make a risk determination, I completely agree uh, with that. But at the same time, we are, you know, we're not in a, we are, believe it or not, DOD has deep pockets, but we don't have unlimited resources. <laughs> so um, it's, not, it's a resource constrained environment. This, a lot of this data is still expensive. We're still paying for it. We'll talk about social media here, I'm sure, at some point. There is still a human involved who has to make sense of all that data. You know, when you're talking about FICA compliance, um, Privacy Act, you know, minimizing protected data, you know, those are all things the government has to worry about and it sometimes limits our options from an efficiency and a cost standpoint. But really when I say we want to tailor our vetting, it's tailor the vetting, tailoring the vetting that we're doing continuously really to the risk that the person presents you know, risk in person, risk in position, risk in access. If they're just coming on the base for a day and going to the PX, you know, with their cousin, um, and they're leaving. I don't need to probably doing be doing the level of vetting continuously that I would want to do on a TSSCI clearance holder, right? But I want to be doing something, right? So it's really setting those thresholds based on the risk and the level of access is really what, and, and, and that continuous nature and piece of it is really critical. We, we need to have that, uh, and we need to have the data all coming, you know, to a single integrated um, data environment so we can, to Jeff's point, kind of leverage it and make sense of it uh, and run the algorithms and analytics on top of it. But, you know, I, I, there's this premise just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And so that's something that um, we, we could, you know, technically our insider threat authority, authorities in DOD are very broad. I mean, very broad. If you look at the 2017 NDAA and the definition we had expanded from just classified systems and access to truly anybody who even former affiliated, right? We have really broad authorities. We could be doing a hell of a lot more under insider threat than we are right now. But, you know, I don't know that it's appropriate. We really, from a privacy standpoint, have a lot to think about in terms of how we expand to those physical logic, physical access only type pop populations. Okay, okay, and then so things like user activity monitoring, one more point, very expensive, okay? So DOD, if I were to cover down on user activity monitoring for all of my NIPR endpoints, we'd be in the billions of dollars dollars very quickly. I can't afford to do that. But my IC insider threat programs would tell me that that is the most important endpoint to cover down on, the nipper net. That's where the temptation is, it's where the DROG is. So what do you do about that? We have, I won't talk about our solution, but what we're doing, but that's another reason why I can't cover down on everything the same. Okay, so we got 10 minutes left, okay? And we got a lot Sorry, of things, we got a lot of things to talk about, okay? <laughs> Uh, and we're going to come back and talk about funding in a minute, okay? And we're going to uh, and we're going to talk about NBIS in a minute, okay? Uh, long pole in the tent, but the uh, but right now I just want to uh, ask a question about social media. Every time we have a uh, you know one of these incidents, uh, uh, a Snowden or whatever, you know we'll go back and say, oh my God, look at all the stuff that uh, was on social media and so forth. Here we are uh, with a CE program that doesn't have a social media component to it. I know you, you say you want to include one uh, eventually, but uh, what is it going to take to get a social media component as part of this uh, uh, continuous evaluation process? I don't think I'm allowed to answer any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, social media on the surface um, seems like it's a you know, very logical tool that should be a part of this. Uh, the guidance out there now that, that was promulgated out of DNI is social media. Um, any department and agency can utilize social media checks if they choose to. Okay, and now there's, there's differing research out there actually on the efficacy of social media checks. While it seems notional, I totally agree, Chuck, that um, you, know, you, see, you see these high profile cases, particularly when you have um, violence, you know, and, and you, you, you go on to their, you know, Facebook account, you see all these indicators and everything, but, but the research that's been done in the national security arena, at least, is um, some of it says, yeah, social media will get you a lot of good stuff, and I think DOD gets a lot of good things from social media. I think it has a lot to do with the, um, I'll just use the term, um, how well seasoned the population is, um, in other words, the, the age of the population. You know, when you're when you're with organizations where individuals may tend to be like me, more well seasoned. 
okay? Um, you're not gonna probably get that much off of social media, okay? Um, for example, I've never had any, any presence whatsoever on social media. However, if you're dealing with a, a younger population there, you know, an enlisted population, not you in particular, <laughs> Terry, totally although you. <laughs> you are definitely less well seasoned than I am. Oh, it's <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, say en enlisted folks in the military that are their huge users of social media, you're probably going to get some very useful take off of that. But, but to your point, um, it's available out there if departments and agencies choose to, um, choose to use it. Can I talk? Or <laughs> so we're using it. Uh, we are, it really gets to that point I made earlier. It's expensive because you do need that human in the process to minimize that third party data, protected class data. Um, we haven't you know, really found a way to do it in a truly automated fashion uh, because of the Privacy Act and restrictions we have and complying with the national policy. So we are looking at, based on kind of like Brian said, where does it make sense to sort of do the social media check based on the other derogatory information that we uncover in the process? And we've got a number of research studies that have sort of led us to understand when you have certain types of derogatory information, you are likely to have, you know, more likely to have um, data illuminated <coughs> through so social media searches that will help you um, give context to that derogatory information. So we're really tailoring it to uh, uh, not the full population, but just trying to be a little more sophisticated about how <coughs> and when we're using it really because of the cost point right now. So that's that's where we are. Okay, so the, the one... Uh offer I would make that uh, on behalf of Carrie and Gary, when I talked to them before about this, they said, hey, if you know companies that have successfully implemented uh, a continuous evaluation program that includes a social media component, they would like to talk to you, okay? Uh, because they're looking for ideas on how to do this better and uh, how to do this uh, efficiently. Uh, and that gets to funding, uh, and this kind of goes to all of you. How do you do all this thing, these things that you talked about without a dedicated funding line? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I've heard I don't you know. talk about that many times. I'm, do you mean for, in, what do you mean? Well, just. Uh, a dedicated uh, funding line. So, I mean, DOD spends like $1.3 billion a year on this mission right now. So we've got, I mean, essentially, I guess the, we are using that resource pot that we, Spend you know annually. Are you talking about the IT? The, so we well, have appropriations talking, we're talking for the about IT. The, talking about the whole thing, you know, in terms uh -huh. of okay, and okay. and and the responsibility to the rest of government uh, uh -huh. to do this. Okay, how do we do this? How do we do this, OMB? Okay, I'll let Matt answer that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a it's a good question. From our perspective, um, it's probably best to divide it into a couple of areas. Uh, first is for the IT. Uh, we've got that appropriated over the fight up. Uh, so Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's close to $600 million uh, that's in the fight up for rebuilding the end-to-end -end IT shared services. And we're well along that uh, journey now with uh, system deployments planned in the very near future. Uh, many of those system deployments that are planned, uh, we believe are going to free up uh, existing capital investments in other areas that allow us to double back down on many of these changes that we're talking about. Uh, the second component, I guess, would be um, the background investigations. You know, NBIB uh, has a budget uh, collected through fee-for-service of uh, one and a half billion dollars or so right now. Um, or, so we're spending a lot of money on background investigations. So uh, the challenge is, is spending it the right way and improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the process. Uh, Tricia mentioned the study that, or the work that they're doing with the CMO uh, and NBIB right now on this business process reengineering study. Uh, we've got high hopes for that to really lean out the process. Uh, there's a lot of places where we can do things differently uh, that'll improve our effectiveness and our efficiency. Um, and then the third uh, kind of spoke of the wheel here is the policy work that we're working with the executive agents for the Trusted Workforce 2.0. Because uh, we need to make sure that whatever policy framework we put in place is actually operi operationalizable and affordable. Uh, so we can't put something out there that's going to cost $10 billion. It's not going to work. Uh, so we're, we're doing the math, and we're really doing a bottoms-up <coughs> and a top-down review as part of all of this work to make sure that um, everything at each one of the levels hooks together 
and uh, Tricia might be able to speak to how some of the transfer work's going, but we found ways to fund everything and, and get everything started and rolling. So, uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, we're not gonna get to several uh, topics. Uh, you know, there's, there's questions in here about uh, uh, independent investigative authority. Uh, you know, the number of agencies that have that, uh, the number that would probably like to have it now. Uh, the, uh, uh, do we roll that back? Do we leave it the same? The reciprocity issues, we're not gonna get to that question. Uh, but there's, uh, uh, I guess, a question that would apply to the audience here uh, in large measure is, you've laid out some plans. We've talked about NBIS and some related things associated with it and so forth. But kind of a general question, for all the things that you want to do that you imagine doing to make this happen, is the technology mature enough to support it? Okay. And uh, if, uh, if, if, if the answer is yes, I guess we can all clap. If, if the answer is uh, we're still thinking about things, what can industry do to support this for you? Okay. So, Carrie, Trish, you want to start on that? I'll start, and, and I'm sure Carrie will finish. Um, I, I, I'm told by our PEO who is building NBIS, um, uh, DISA, um, who we are bringing into uh, the agency so that we own the whole IT platform as we own the national mission, so that's, that's forthcoming. Um, Technology is never the problem. Um, it, it's the way we apply it, it's the way we implement it, it's the, it's the privacy rules, it's, it's all of the other, um, uh, other things that, that are the harder lift uh, to get over. I can tell you that I, my confidence in this arena right now is higher than it's ever been because we are working hand in, hand in glove with our system developers. So um, the, the DSS team that I'm standing up in concert with grabbing the, the, the smart SMEs in, in the NBIB workforce um, are coming together with the system developers, defining the requirements, they, the system development is a, is a safe, agile acquisition, one that DOD, I'm told, has had in its arsenal for a while but hasn't implemented it often. Um, and so it's been a very big learning curve for me where system developers are sitting next to functional requirements owners uh, doing small sprints of capability development, testing it, kicking the tires, uh, making sure we have the strategic communication plan, the training, everything that goes with it to be able to roll it out the door in incremental steps in a more agile fashion. That's the team that um, Mr. Terry Carpenter, our PEO uh, for NBIS and me as the business owner are building together and, and we're looking to, to actually, it, it's, it's just standing up, but we wanna, we wanna stand it up in an in a environment that is uh, more, I'll call it Silicon Valley-ish, um, something that we can attract the young talent to, um, to want to work, not in your standard government cubicle, but actually in an environment where they can bring in their wireless toys and, and all the, the things that, that, you know, that motivates them to, to really do uh, good system development work. So that's the kind of environment that I can tell you Mr. Carpenter and I, and I are trying to create in concert with the, the construct that, that we're given by the policy uh, owners uh, to give us as much flexibility as possible. So I think that my short answer would be to, you know, leveraging, putting new IT on top of what still looks and feels a lot like kind of current process, but has a CE flair to it. That's kind of where we are. You know, I think we're at a point where we'll be rolling out uh, on the timeline that we've established really for the fall to really start having that new end-to-end -end IT capability, but still aligned to process that kind of looks and feels a lot like it does today. For this future state, you know, true integrated aspirational architecture world where we've got everything from the tactical, tactical edge, foreign screening, embedding, we're doing downrange, filtering into a single data environment um, and all the other insider threat related human data coming together and running algorithms and analytics on that. We, we've got a ways to go. Um, so right now, um, we've got pieces of, of that capability, you know, working well, but SOCOM, CENTCOM, um, some of it uh, closer to home in DC, but we've got a lot of work to do yet to kind of bring this much more holistic approach together from an IT standpoint. And I'll, I'll end with, um, we also are establishing a research and innovation arm that will be 
um, just a, a standard operating procedure and an element of our future um, so that we continue the development and research and continuously improve, as I mentioned before. So I'll, I'll uh, end with there's lots of questions here on uh, things like uh, when do we eliminate PRs? You know, when do we move the CE to the top secret population? When do we do all those sorts of things? We're not going to get that today. So we are doing it for top secret. They okay. gave us the authority to do that. TS and secret. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, quick answer. Okay. But, uh, but, uh, but I'm going to uh, come back and revisit some of these questions with you guys, and we'll find a way to get some of these uh, questions that didn't get asked uh, back to you. Okay. Uh, final thoughts, Jeff? I do a lot of work also with the privacy community, and I've summarized everything I've learned from that universe, and that is avoid consumer surprise. If you kind of just think of that, uh, that as highest order principle, it covers you on most everything that you could get sideswiped on, you're surprised about. Trish, final thoughts? No, I look forward to uh, working with industry uh, in the future too. Uh, there's programs ongoing, uh, TIP, you know, um, getting uh, industry input up front. Uh, we can. We, we need to be looking at all those opportunities. So thank you for for the opportunity okay. today, Chuck. Okay, Carrie. Um, I would say if anything you've heard today, if you really feel like you have something that can help us get to this future state, please come. I mean, what I don't have time for, what Trisha doesn't have time for, we're going 100 miles an hour every day. I don't have time to go out and get you know this vendor briefing, that vendor briefing. But if you really feel like you, I just sat and did a Raytheon virtual reality thing, I was like, oh, there's actually something in there for my foreign screening and vetting mission I'm interested in, right? So I just, that's that's the challenge. We know there's good stuff out there. You guys know your capabilities certainly better than we do. We spent an hour plus talking about our problem set and what we're trying to do. So if you feel like you can help us. We're very open to that. Just, just you know, I, 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 I just would love to hear from you if you feel like you have something that really could kind of help us get from where we are to where we're trying to go. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, early, earlier, Carrie did a very nice job of explaining what um, continuous vetting means versus continuous evaluation, and I would just close by mentioning that uh, at ODI, and i we, we are developing the continuous evaluation system you know, FIS compliance, um, fulsome data protections, utilizing cross-domain capabilities, you know, high to low, low to high, um, for the use of all departments and agencies in the federal government that want to use it. Um, we're well on our way. We're up and operational across a number of required data sets under the FIS. And I think, you know, um, DOD's done some great things in terms of continuous vetting, continuous evaluation, and I think this is truly revolutionary. Yeah. And, we're, and, and, and we're, we're using DNI's <clears throat> CE solution right. for a number of the data sets that, frankly, they're just ahead of us in getting on the high side. So it's, it's not competitive. I don't want anyone to exactly. have that impression. Yeah. It's okay, really Matt, final word. All right, if anyone feels like they've got a burning question or just wants to geek out, I'm going to hang out here <laughs> after the meeting. I really like geeking out, so uh, feel free. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks to you guys for what you're doing, and uh, thanks for you guys for your interest, and thank our panel. Thank you.